hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you just seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? But this is a newer video than the one that I'm using. Uh, the one thing to notice is in this picture, he has income here, he has life expectancy here. Okay. But he cheats. Income is logarithmic. So it goes 4,000, uh, 4, 40,000. 400,000, whatever it is, are uh, in the same interval. So it's a logarithmic. So it kind of skews to look at the world as much more compact than it from the tribute. You are going to say that? So sometimes, you know, some people uh, store the graph in, in, in incorrect information. But I think it's mostly because we just put it in But some, one, I'm a great fan of San Jose and Bo. Basically, they are the TED lectures. They are several TED lectures that are worth watching uh, about the number of children, health, income distribution. All kinds of different things work well. Right, so it looks like an animation, but actually you can go to the website, the uh, keepminder.org, to play with the data to get the inside of those uh, data about this world. So uh, let me show you an example. This is actually the application. You can, uh, you can Analyze it as an animation, we can stop at any point to do the further investigation. So there used to be uh, arguments about whether uh, which uh, visualization is better for a uh, static web or the animations, but right now we have the interactive visualization of the game. So I think that's kind of argument. It doesn't make any sense right now because you can run the whole history of it. You can have to view the whole picture by the animation. Also, you can stop at any frame to study. Yeah, it's like uh, this is not the manipulate the application, this is the type of demonstration of the data. So, this is different. Uh, also, I, in this week, I have found another very interesting application for the mountains. Right? I'll show you the income distribution of different countries in the recent uh, 200 years ago. Uh, 200 years. So each strip represents one country. Right? The heights of the strip represent the population. Right? So a specific income level. All right? So I choose my mother country, China. 
about the endemic of a disease called polio. So in 1988, when I was born, so almost all the countries in the world, they suffer from this disease polio. However, in 2012, all the way, almost most of the countries they are polio-free countries. So this is an example. Another one is uh, a geological uh, email about the year of the prediction of another fatal disease called smallpox. Smallpox. So on this map, you can find some interesting features, like actually those so-called small developing country here, like the Costa Rica. They actually they are direct, directing eradicate smallpox even earlier than the United States. So this is the power of the biological. They can give you some information. In a very, very short time. You do not need to do anything or comparing or sorting or using paper. Alright? So I, I can get interested about the clear situation of the world. So I can search on the WHO the website and I find a lot of different disease reports. They find published everything. So this is a 2016 award malaria report. All right, they have uh, like 50 pages, and most of the, those pages, they include different kind of graph in the report. Which is kind of interesting because I'm a, a major in the county system, I read a lot of annual reports. So, thank you for the annual financial report for the public firms, and also they are kind of those kind of summaries. For the annual report, they always look like this. So they never include uh, any kind of comfort graph in your report. So, so which one you prefer, the previous one or this one? I think most of the general public they like this one. They want. If I force you to, you have to read one of those reports. I think most of the people will choose this one. All right. Actually, the visualization not only there will be 
program allows increased efficiency, maybe improves effectiveness, but also effectiveness to inspire the general public. The reason why I believe WHO includes a large amount of red light, I think this one is uh, used by the law, actually. They can use some code to use this kind of red. So the reason why is that the HO choose to include a large amount of red into the official report is that it won't open the door of the data to the public. It won't the public to understand the situation of the of this work. So why not we really including the graph into the template? That's my idea when I prepare this presentation. Right? So why not when we are living in a time that we have the ability, we have the technology, first we can combine data, we can combine science, we can combine visualization together into a piece of which is meaningful and which can help reduce the evolution symmetry. So why not we use that? All right, this is my presentation. Thank you. Information of quality and she and me have the same set of information. Information asymmetry is when she has a lot of information I have not provided first. So when you look at information of that management has about the company, then you look at information that stockholders have about the company. Management has a lot. Stockholders have very little information of human. He was saying, by explaining the graph, you are reducing the difference in comprehension. You guys have any questions for Lou? We already used one. Yeah. So my question is, um, as I come in that field, a lot of what we do is protecting the accuracy and the integrity of the data. Why should we care about data visualization? Shouldn't we focus more on protecting the integrity of the data source? So, and that should be that's something we visualization won't affect. Mm -hmm. However, it's a better community tool to communicate the data to the general public. For you, the thing is for the economy. So you really need to For the general public, the general part, it's a super borrow for how to put them to read mm -hmm. such kind of long area. But if you add some graph into the support, because we are all visual animals. So they may really be interested for the public to read those before we do this effort. So therefore, they kind of reduce the symmetry between the general public and the, the secret of the day of that company. That's the idea of the visualization. And I'm not meaning that visualization is a better like, thing than the general tables. But visualization, to, to some extent, it can inspire general public the better communication from the product. It won't affect. So under the, you know, the, uh, the, the Professor Dawson, the Foxius, they explore the images. We mm -hmm. look at the image to maybe deliver some wrong or fake information. Mm -hmm. This is not a problem of visualization. You can use paper, you can use work, you can use a sentence to do the same thing. But the idea is under Good standard, we can still use visualization. Protect the great idea, still, and we can use a narrow task. Although we might finish up doing that to convince the PCLB that this is a good idea. Uh, we need maybe some proof and, and etc. But that's the kind of thing that they are working. I am going to actually now, it occurs to me. And they are remind me of this, okay? Uh, occurs to me, I go, we have already some examples of doing these three things in uh, state data and we have it in other data too. Uh, data that we collected from, uh, that is public data from uh, Northeastern University. And we are, I, can, I can show you that, it's pretty interesting. Okay, thank you very much, we don't have to hold on.
hang out here and attend the whole body class of mine. Okay? Uh, thank you very much. So I think what we should do is do a group now, and then I will do some continuous auditing, or we do a second group, and then I do continuous auditing for you. Okay? So I'm Nick. Our presentation's on facial recognition and the future. Uh, so what is facial recognition? It's a biometric method of identifying an individual by comparing live capture or digital image with the stored record for that person. Experts project that by 2022, it will be a $9.6 billion industry. So a brief timeline of events. 1960, uh, semi-audit uh, face recognition system was developed by Woodrow W. Bledsoe under the contract of the U.S. governor. They use uh, features such as the eyes and ears of photographs. 1991, face detection was pioneered by Turk and Palin, making real-time face recognition possible. In uh, 2001, it was the first time that face recognition was ever used on a large group of people. It was used during the uh, Super Bowl, so right after 9-11. And it was called the Super Bowl. It was kind of controversial. In uh, 2014, the FBI launched the interstate photo system as part of the ongoing next generation identification. Um, gives Law enforcement agencies are a database to use the images in to uh, so, uh, prevent terrorism and other kind of things. And then in 2015, Facebook started to roll out their deep face recognition system, which is probably the most accurate one to date. And Intel unveiled the True Key app, which allows users to use facial recognition to get access to their online accounts. So a brief how it works is a very basic. Greg's going to get into the algorithms they use, but this is like the basic process that it does. So one capturing, uh, it'll take a picture or you can scan a face into the system, then it'll extract different data that it collects from about the face, depth of eye sockets, distance between the eyes, shape of the cheekbone, and width of the nose are four common ones. And uh, then it'll compare. It'll compare the data to. Uh, compare the information just collected to the, the data stored within the database, and then matching. The software determines whether or not the face matches to any picture stored within the database. So I'm going to get a little bit more in depth. I might repeat some of the things that Nick said. But um, first, with um, our facial recognition project, the first part is to take detecting that's an actual face. Um, it detects uh, pixels in the image to represent faces is to make sure that it's not like an arm or like a nose face or anything or to recognize that it's human. And um, with facial uh, recognition, the actual test is the actual test of recognizing the face by analyzing the part of the image identified during the face recognition process. And some of the problems that uh, are faced during this process could be a uh, illumination problem, um, changes in the illumination of an image, can mildly affect the results uh, when uh, reading a facial recognition. Um, different pose changes, because not it's hard to have a picture um, to detect pictures that all are going to have a front-facing image. So this is also an issue that's, um, that needs to be uh, analyzed. And also a time delay. Of course, the aging of humans affects the way that they look over time and uh, the recognition process. How about beards? And beards as well. That's why um, if you go back to last uh, the the depth of eye sockets, distance between the eyes, and the shape cheekbone with the nose, they really don't change much over time. That's why why they use those four. So I'm going to talk about uh, one of the statistical methods methods used for um, facial, rec facial recognition. Um, I found this to be a very uh, difficult uh, topic to totally understand. I read like ten different. Um, like journals, watch 10 different videos, but this is, um, I try to condense it and make it as simple as possible for this presentation, so I'm gonna do the best that I can. Um, so appearance-based methods are used to define the different ways how to measure the distance between two images. So this is to tr try to find, um, try to find a way to say how similar two faces are that are being um, analyzed. Uh, one method that I came across that I could focus on is the principal contact uh, component analysis. Um, it is a dimension reduction tool that can be used to reduce a large set of variables to a small set that still contains most of the information in the large set. Um, and 
have how to express the distance between two uh, two faces. This process is called um, eigenface eigenfaces. So it's images that represent the mean differences between all the images in the data set. I'm going to get a little bit more in depth on that now. So the eigenface algorithm. Uh, so the first the first step step is uh, the set of pictures. Um, that you're gonna first analyze. So this, this is before we put it into like the statistical analysis. And we convert these into grayscale uh, gray images for um, the processing steps. So um, it's important, out of all the uh, faces that we get, we have to normalize them, create a new training set, and we take all these images and we get a meat face, or it's not a meat face, but an average face, um, to help with the uh, analysis process. So the next step would be uh, computing the hiding face components. So you, so this is where it gets a little tricky. So you subtract your training faces, which are these guys. Actually, no, which was the last, the last slide. You subtract these from the meat face and you get these new faces called beating faces. And then from there, you, um, you uh, the face that you're trying to match up, or like to see if it's a, a match with uh, one of the uh, faces in your database. So this is like your input, your input image that you're getting. And um, the, the program analysis this picture, and it, um, So, the reconstructed image is generated from the input image, depending if it's in the database or not. So, the it found, so this shows that it found an image that was uh, had the same similar uh, distances between the input image. So, the distances that I'm referring to, the things that like was talking about, like um, the the length of like your chin line, the the depth between your eye and the tip of your nose from, uh, it's hard to tell from those pictures, but that's what uh, the darkness of the, the pixels are showing. And from that, it, um, which from this example, it shows that it, had, it was a match from the uh, database. That's uh, the best way to simplify it. Uh, like all these things on the side right here, like there's all like math, math behind it, like these, these they're not even complex, complex equations, but they're really hard to um, um, analyze and present to you in a short time. But like, I have um, a work cited here if you want to look more into uh, the details of this you process. I did values on a common statistical measure. Yeah. And so they transform eigenvalues into, mm -hmm. into visual measurement. Patterns. Exactly, exactly. Good.
diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, is the one less
they're shown in the first two uh, pictures. You put the goggles on and it lights up where the uh, where your face is, and the light is invisible to the human eye, but it, the light reflects with the camera, so they can't get your image. But then they also had an updated version called the privacy visor. It no longer has the lights, but the material still has a reflective netting that has angled in patterns and it confuses the technology, so that also can grab your face. Um, Adam Harvey, he's an artist and he's creating a um, hyperface and it's eventually going to be used as a scarf and he says that the scarf pattern has falsified faces on it and it will mess up the technology because they'll think that the scarf has a face on it so it'll try and detect a face within the scarf and it'll confuse the technology as well. And here's some style tips. Uh, for makeup it says that like dark makeup um, or painted on. Um, I can't explain it. I'll show you in the next slide there are pictures of it. Um, the nose bridge partially obscured the nose bridge area. Um, this is where like, it really focus, the video really focuses on to grab your image. Um, and then also the mask. They say don't wear masks because it's illegal. Uh, there's the head and the symmetry. And then these are the style tips that Adam Harvey came up with, and he said that all of these pictures will avoid and mess with the camera. Um, so these might be some new trends coming in. Yeah. I don't think it's not true that uh, in the, uh, the 
I don't think there has been a great comparison. Maybe there are more public applications in China, maybe it's more security applications in China. We don't know. But clearly, face recognition is very powerful. You know, the biometrics, the whole set of different biometrics. Your face, features, fingerprints, uh, iris, voice, DNA, all kinds of things. And I'm very afraid of uh, applications with biometrics. Because once the biometric is collected, if it's not immediately encrypted in one direction, you, everyone can have a copy of your biometrics. So any leak will go to everyone. So I sometimes, I much prefer passwords or etc. that you, when someone catch your file, password, you change the password. But <laughs> if someone catches your DNA imprint, you, know, you can't really change the DNA. So I, you know, a lot of talk about biometrics. And certain things, biometrics are obviously good, meaning airlines, stores, parking lots, protection, facial recognition, fantastic. But in a long range, certain biometrics worry me a lot because of, uh, you know, you can't expect every application that uses this to be uh, prepared and used by people that know what they are doing. And there is some someone collecting fingerprints, right, collecting voice, uh, that will be broken in. And then from one second to the other, your biometrics are for sale in the dark, dark web. If your password is for sale in the dark web, what do you do? Just change it. Right? But don't change your biometrics. So that's a little bit of a concern I have. It's tremendous technology. Tremendous technology. For example, to give you an example, uh, I use Picasso in our stock, producing it by Google, but it's very good. And it has big recognition. Okay, one of the interesting things it does, it mixes my son with me. It really mixes. And my son is Asian. <laughs> at least half Asian. But it can detect. It can, it can pick it up. Um, very uh, interesting. Uh, and there are all kinds of secondary applications that you can think, think about the value of face recognition. But in general, if you want good protection, go for dual verification, trio verification, etc. Et Thank you very much. A little bit of time, so what I'm going to do is spend about uh, uh, half an hour talking about. Uh, Continuous auditing, and then we have a little break, and then uh, the next group presents, and then we go back to the methods and continuous auditing. I want to start talking about continuous auditing. First, saying that our car lab of continuous auditing and the reporting laboratory is the leading continuous auditing organization, research organization. Um, and we have been, I have been working on this for 86 to now. Um, and it has been a very, very slow development. Uh, I joined Bell Labs in uh, 85, actually. And we started in 86, uh, what we call the CPAS project. The CPAS project was, um, was finished, so to speak, in 1990. Uh, first, Alper and myself published the first article in 91. And then I went around uh, to the Institute of Internal Auditors, IIA, to the ICPA, uh, to Isaac at that time in the Audit Association, talking about continuous audit. And typically, the teaching evaluations, evaluations are by Google. Some people said this way, this is the future, other people, this guy is a maniac, doesn't know what to talk. 
In 99, so how many years after we started? 13 years we started. Uh, the Canadian Institute of CPAs started a task force on continuous audit. They have been hearing about it, so they started. Canadians are uh, more innovative. And uh, Don Warren was a partner of PwC at that time. Called me up and said, Because you want to join the task force. Because I asked, Of course, I want to join the task force. But uh, I said, Don, you have a lot of the CGA, ICPA, get them aboard. So he did, and so the task force, 98, 99, was a Canadian Institute at that time, CICA, Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants, and they ICPA did this task force, and we published what we call the Red Book. So it was the first book for guidance on continuous audit. So that's 99, uh, I published the first article in 91, Professor Hogan and myself were already here writing articles this. And uh, in 2003, uh, the Institute of Internal Auditors, IIA, published GTAG number three that started working on computer auditing. And uh, three years ago, they published GTAG number 16, and that's their guidance. And the Institute of, Institute of uh, Sorry, the ISAC Institute of System Auditability and Controlling the Auditors Association finally issued the guidance in 2010. Last year, we rewrote the red book and we called the pink book, but it was called Continuous Auditing and Analytical Methods. And I'm going to send you actually a copy of it. You remember? I'll send them, yeah. Okay. Um, which was second thing that the ICPA published on this. So it has been a long <laughs> story behind this, uh, but what finally is happening is that some organizations are really actually started doing continuous auditing. In about uh, six years ago, uh, one of our PhD students, Sibi Pan, um, who can kind of out, the image is tied, we, we did a survey because we saw these surveys by PwC and, and ENY saying that 60% of the organizations were doing continuous audit. And we just hadn't observed that. So sponsored by KPMG, we did a study and we visited like 11 leading internal audit departments. And none of them was doing continuous auditing but some of them were kind of evolving in that direction. Uh, at that time, we found a whole set of obstacles to continuous audit. Uh, the biggest obstacle we found was data access. We are, you know, everyone thinks that auditors get any data they want. And they don't. And if you are an external auditor and you annoy the client, you lose the client. So you try to be reasonably careful about what you ask. And when we interviewed this, this large organization, you would recognize the name of eight out of those nine or 10 out of those are that. We don't count two of them for some other reasons. Um, when we talk to them, they all said the same thing. They have a lot of difficulty getting the data that they want. If you go on our website, you actually are going to see stories by IBM, for example, telling what they did in the continuous auditing area. Build it back in. Okay. And we actually found something interesting. I expected when we did our little survey that um, banks would be the leading users because the risk you know, the, the inventory is money. The leakage is money going out of the door. On the other hand, if you're talking about Pepsi-Cola, the leakage would carry gallons of Pepsi-Cola out of the door. So it's not so easy to steal, okay? And so we found that. And actually what we found is, yes, banks were the, uh, were the kind of leaders leading, tending in that adoption, but 
computer companies were doing quite a lot. And uh, I actually never understood why, why is that case. Uh, but what we are finding now is much more companies starting to set up things that they call continuous audit. And that explained to me, actually, um, something I hadn't understood is why survey by the large CPA firms found that 40 to 60% of the companies were doing continuous audit. And the reason was definition, purely definition. What is a continuous audit? And if you did an audit, and then you had difficulties on the audit, and you came back six months later, and we did it, they called it continuous audit. And that's not even close to what we call continuous auditing, which is very close to the event type of audit. And I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do in this area and the little methods we are using. And then I'm going to come back and ask you what is this audit of the future and what's going to happen. Just for your information, today is Monday. On Wednesday, a uh, gentleman called Michael Smith is going to come to visit us. And he is, the, he is the leader of continuous auditing at PwC. And he says he has, at least we are in a panel together, he has over 20 clients doing continuous auditing. And so in the big book, the, the revision of the red book, we did a survey between the big four. And what we found is none of the big four is doing continuous auditing with their clients, meaning in that external audit. But two of them are actually selling continuous audit methods to internal audit departments. Now, think about that and tell me why do you think that here it is, these, uh, these large, uh, uh, these large CPA firms sell the service, but they don't apply it themselves. They may not have the technical know-how. If they sell the service, they have the technical know-how, correct? Right? Meaning you don't sell something you don't know. Well, you might, they, but maybe. Then it's not as wrong. I'm just joking with you. <laughs> huh? Then it's not as wrong. We're not doing politics here today, okay? Uh, <laughs> so why? <laughs> Andrea, you're allowed to answer too. Okay, well I was just, I wanted to get you thinking, if you think about the terms of um, reasonable assurance, right? Like auditors, they're not um, engaged to examine 100% of the transactions. So if you think about that, with continuous auditing, you can use that technology to examine and test the entire population. But the question is, are you going to get credit for doing that? I think that that's, uh, that's uh, one of the reasons. I think that uh, well, the reason is the standards don't facilitate. The standards make it difficult to do that. There is no payback, correct? Uh, yeah, but they don't. They don't encourage it, but they don't say you you resort to sampling only. So yeah, they don't discourage they, they it, don't but they don't encourage it either. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the standards are a difficulty. I think the other thing, company. I always say in auditing, you don't develop really uh, infrastructure for auditing. You develop infrastructure for operations, and if the infrastructure is there, you can use it for auditing too. Um, this is not always true at Bell Labs. We develop infrastructure. We pick up part of the infrastructure and develop a little bit of infrastructure to do our continuous auditing effort, but we have a research institution. Uh, so uh, I always say that. And when I showed you the usage of, uh, uh, usage of uh, GPS, uh, did I show that here? Usage of GPS, imagining the audit? Oh, yes. Yeah. Did I show here inventory, RFID, and et cetera, et cetera? Okay, uh, when you, you are not going to put RFID chips on every item of inventory to satisfy auditors, are you? 
not like. Okay, so that's uh, that's kind of the preamble here. Um, but I have recently, very recently, started seeing a lot of companies starting something that they call continuous uh, audit. Already? Real time auditing, like like machines that would do like part of the auditing. I have uh, some definitions here. I'm going to use it in a second. So give me a second and I'll get it. I don't know why this is taking Oh, because I haven't read the slides. Look at this. You see what she puts in? Yeah, go. I started this, this slide deck when I was still at Bell Labs four years ago. And I keep changing the day and then accept it. So the first thing is the real time economy. Um, let me ask you the following question. Why do you do things faster in real, close to real time? I mean, there are a lot of things that are now being done close to real time. So what's the purpose? We are talking about this. Why? So if you do more whatever we're doing. Okay, and why else? Increase accuracy. Okay, do it. Okay, what else? Okay, let's talk economic terms. Two types of delay. One type of delay we call it the intro process latency, which is typically how long it takes to do a job. Okay, so if you're assembling something or you are building something, etc., it takes some time to do. The other thing is how long it takes to pass the information between your processes. And that we call inter-process latency. And I already talked to you about XPRL. Remember? And Professor Kaitan showed a little bit about XPRL. What's the purpose of XPRL? Is to decrease inter-process latency. Two computers can transfer data without manual intervention. The third latency is how long it takes to make a decision. And the fourth latency is how long it takes after making a decision to get an outcome. But the whole reason to reducing latency, and you guys were kind of in the ballpark, is to decrease the occupation of capital. What does that mean? This very economic side. Of that. What is occupation of capital? is you are using your capital to buy, to have, for example, inventory. If you keep the inventory for less time, you are using less capital. Keeping capital costs you money. Yes, no, am I talking Japanese here? And so, the faster you do things, you use capital for less time, costs you less money. If you occupy capital for very little time and your competitor occupies it for a long time, he's going to go back. Because you're going to pick up, your costs are going to be slower, you are going to basically take over the markets. So this is the idea of the real time economy. Is the faster you can do things, you do them better and you use less money to do. And some things, uh, you have, you have, have you ever heard uh, something that was very popular 20 years ago? Just-in-time manufacturing. Okay, what is just-time manufacturing? Instead of having large piles of inventory, and you assemble your cars, assemble whatever you're selling, the inventory keeps arriving while 
you are putting the car together, whatever you are manufacturing. And therefore, you don't keep a lot of inventory. That's very good, correct? You're saving a lot of money. But it's not so good. Why? What's the problem? That's right. If something misses, something doesn't arrive, you are stuck. So you have a, a you are Boeing, and you are manufacturing in six different locations, uh, and then you are bringing those parts together to Seattle, and you are assembling the dream line. If one of those production lines stops, you only have the dream. You don't have the line. You guys are not in very good mood today. We have an exam today. Oh, that's why. Right. What exam do you have? Economics. Oh, that must be very difficult. I, I did that to her when she was taking her PhD exam. I keep saying it's going to be very difficult. I was really scared, actually. <laughs> she didn't look any. She didn't look scared at all. Um, Okay, so that's really the reason to do things. And then people say something like, oh, we are not in the real time economy. If you have any ERP, uh, like SAP or etc., there are certain type of information needed. For just in time, you need inventory, real time inventory. For pay your receivables, you need overnight receivable. Why? Because to take discounts. You get this count, two percent if you pay on time, and etc. Et and to collect this count. So three things. And then, if you are any self-respecting business, you apply money or borrow money overnight. So you need to know every day what is your cash situation. Just to give you four examples: payables, receivables, inventory, and cash, which are really your main accounts anyway. So. I guess we are in the real-time economy, and actually many of these uh, major systems now actually... Okay, uh, we talked enough about things here. I actually... Uh, uh, this is actually KPMG's paper, and they are talking about something that we have been discussing uh, in the last decade in our conferences is what's the difference between continuous monitoring and con continuous audit? And I always say um, you can't do continuous audit without continuous monitoring. In the project at at and the first project that we did on continuous auditing, uh, we had actually this continuous audit process and we developed it without management, just auditors developed it. But we were monitoring basically billing at at and And uh, and what happened is that we had a, a little problem and we stopped the operations. And, uh, and uh, the operation people were very happy with us. Uh, and so we started talking to them about it. And finish up that we finished uh, developing a system we call the Prometheus system for management and the parallel system for auditing. I'm going to come back and talk about that because that's essential to it. But Jim Mitter from KPM, he made this difference. He said, the monitors is management who audits is auditor. And basically, you need a layer of monitoring to do auditing. I'm going to show you also what the uh, PWC people say about this. Uh, this is actually a kind of wishful thinking graph. I always show it. Uh, but it's actually nice to see about five levels and think about how you think about them. This is what's going on in your business, in your ERP. Second level is, uh, this is going on in your business. This is actually your ERP, where you collect the data about this. And that's why ERP is Enterprise Resource Planning System, like SAP and Oracle. And the purpose of it is to collect data and to organize the data 
on your organization. And I actually showed you this as the relation database in the middle and of a set of applications working with a common set of data. That's the way I, I kind of explained it to you, and that's a, a reasonable way to explain it. Mm -hmm. uh, and typically what I talk about continuous auditing or continuous monitoring is I do like this. This is your operations and their measurement, and then you have a measure. Let's say it's 200. And then you will have a model that tells you what, what this should be. We call it a standard in, in those studies, a standard. And there is always a difference. Very seldom the system works exactly the way you do it. You sell as much as you thought you would sell. You sell more, you sell less. There is delays, whatever. And what we used to have is a standard acceptable error in delta. And if this delta was larger than the variance that we found, fine, no problem. If the delta was smaller, meaning your error was bigger than the acceptable error, you would create an exception or an alarm. So, you know what you expect. You make a measurement, calculate the difference, could be smaller or bigger, and you have to predefine the acceptable delta. If your error is bigger than that, you have a problem. You know, you always work with models in your head. You are, you are home, you have two children, taking care of your children. They are playing in your backyard. Okay, and you tell them, you stay in the backyard, don't go to the front of the house, that car is there. Your mom, if you see the kid walking to the front, violating your manual, you are creating an alarm. And this whole idea of monitoring is always like that. You have a model, and you compare a measurement to the model. And if the kid is just walking on the line there, you don't say too much. If it goes 10 feet ahead of the line, you get excited about it. Same kind of thing, it's monitoring, and this whole idea of monitoring is being done in factories, is done in time machines, is done in time cards, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's done everywhere. And the concept is very, very simple. The concept is compare a mental model or a physical model or a numerical model uh, with an actual. And if the difference is very big, you have an alert. And systems, you know, the knowledge we really always work on cybernetic system. What is a cybernetic system? It's a system that adjusts. So if you have a, a large paper pulp factory, and the paper is starting to get too dry, you inject water into it. Start to get too wet, you stop putting water in, or you add some solvent or whatever you are you're going to do. So there are systems that are just. And in manufacturing, you have a lot of these systems. Uh, systems that, that do steel, etc., etc. They are all self-adjusting systems. But in accounting, we haven't done too much of that. Uh, but we are evolving in that direction. Now, so, so this is the basics, the theoretical basis of continuous monitoring and continuous audit. Now, the big difference from the past to now is that now you can do a lot of these things totally automatically. And when you devise this stuff, technology was very different. And you're going to see a couple of the pictures and then at the end I'm going to ask you to tell me uh, with modern technology how will continuous auditing be? Okay, I want you to think a little bit about it. Now, uh, tell you a little bit of story of our, of our color. Uh, I took a leaf from Rutgers, a sabbatical, 
in 97. And I went to work with KPMG. Spent six months in Montville, around here. And what we did, we devised the continuous auditing project. I was, I had left full-time Bell Labs, I was just part-time Bell Labs, so I pulled out from there and went to, to work for, and I wanted to do a continuous auditing project. I had this project at the Bell Labs. Uh, this project was still working, they but now was with operations. Um, and I was talking around it, I, et cetera, et cetera. No one was adopting it. Okay, so I said, oh, well, let's make it happen. So I spent six months there. The day I stepped out and we had a project, they canceled the project. They can cancel the project. And I said, I canceled the project. Uh, the guy who worked with me there, a guy called Tim Bell, um, had a misfortune of being on that flight with me just after that. So we spent two hours discussing this, this thing. And he said, you, we were a failure, we pissed off the client. I mean, we have many companies we work here and we seldom make some of them. But that was the case. So, but he said, he also said, if you find data, um, we'll fund you. And so I tried to buy a bankrupt.com. I couldn't find data. I tried to buy bankrupt.com, bought it. Judge Vito using the data. So I unbought it. I didn't pay for it. Um, and one day, just out of the blue sky, I get a, I get a call from HCA, the old hospital corporation of America. Very large organization. They had like 200 hospitals and 200 medical centers in the south of the US, one in Paris, and seventy. And they said, you know, we have some problem with Medicare reimbursement, and we are we are under government oversight, uh, and we need R&D. We don't have R&D. Can you help us? And I just asked one question: Do you have data? And they told, oh yeah, we have as much data as you want. Okay. And so we did this project here. We called it the Continuous Equation Project. And what we did is we monitored and and create the models and look for exceptions of the supply chain of drugs because that was the problem. And so was uh, was basically not purchases. It was basically what arrived in a warehouse was distributed in one centralized warehouse. It was distributed to nine hospitals and consumed. And so Professor Kogan, who is here, when myself wrote this paper, was a dissertation of a gentleman called Jiao Wu, who is the partner chairman accounting at UMass now. And uh, it was basically representing business in the form of equations. And the nice thing about that, it was dynamic representation. It's last period and this period. And there was a delay of 14 days, so we put the 14 days there. It was very, very nice modeling. Uh, the results were good. HCA liked the work. Um, and then we tried to publish this paper. And it came out in 2014. And the audit job. Andrea, don't listen to this. And uh, I looked at the date it got published and the date we first submitted. It was 10 years and 7 months. And was it a bad paper? No, it was a very good paper. Paper is still kind of leading edge thinking. It's just very difficult to publish forward we are looking things in accounting journals. Don't listen to this. Okay. Uh, and but it was this kind of thing. And we actually at this moment trying to do a continued equation project. Uh, despite of the 10 years and 7 months publication. But we think this time, uh, it's good that Lou wasn't here while I was talking about continued equation. <laughs> because he is like Andrea, I shouldn't have heard about that. Uh, I'll give you something a little more positive. Our, our process mining paper only took 3 years and 2 months to publish. So that was a little bit faster. 
Okay. Um, and then we discovered that you know this was maybe too detailed to, to monitor. And so we started doing some kind of uh, dashboard monitoring, the KPIs, key performance indicators, and et cetera, et cetera. And we hope eventually that a lot of parallelism between between monitoring operations and assurance at the same time. Haven't seen too many of those, although there are some companies that are starting to do more in the summer. So I captured this document from PwC. And I just said, well, I'll show the KPMG one, let me show one. And this is like last year's published. And so there's this guy, his name is Michael Smith. He, he was talking about what is continuous audio, some equations. They are pretty simple equations. We, you would have any problem understanding, but let me put it in here. Is the move towards continuous audit may be complex, but its valid benefits are undeniable from other business. Many people consider continuous auditing, CA, and continuous monitoring to be synonymous. But that's not true. CM, continuous monitoring, is the tracking and analyze of key performance indicators, and other outlines to improve the focus of the audit resources or to better determine areas in the auditing. This is their opinion. Okay? CA is just what the term implies application or actual internal audit tests on an ongoing basis. The test period can vary from quarterly to monthly, but the procedures are performed in a continual fashion, designed to get as close as possible to actual transaction process. This is in stark contrast to the tradition of audit test work, which is forensic and static in nature. Forensic means what? Backward looking. And static in nature is you examine a mid-year and year-end, what we call uh, the, the rhythm of, uh, of an audit typically is you are assuring the balance sheet that income state. What is balance sheet? It's a set of levels of accounts at the end of the year. And what is income statement is what accumulated during the year. So I call it levels and flows. And typically what it is is that there is some work during the year to look at controls and then there is a big peak of work to verify balance. And so this is the kind of thing that he says that this happens. How about a little break here, because I see a couple of people working out. And uh, we'll come back at 3.35. Okay, on time.
measures in real time, and so you don't have to wait a week for your results. It's transmits to your smartphone or whatever device you're using, and you can see the results immediately. So a quick little video overview. My name is Ali Javi. I'm a professor of uh, electrical engineering and computer sciences at Berkeley. The big flavor of our research is bridging chemistry with electrical engineering. The goal of this project was to develop a wearable technology that we could use to get some accurate and meaningful information about the physiological state of an individual. Sweat provides us with a wealth of information about our body condition and consists of a wide spectrum of different chemicals. I wait. But how do we get information that is accurate, useful about the body and health and mental conditions by analyzing sweat? We have developed this array of sensors that can detect and analyze multiple different chemicals simultaneously in real time. And the operating level is also normal. Yeah. And at the same time, we have developed the computation that goes along with it. Uh, microprocessor. There is the flexible printed uh, electronic component. This is where we have the sensors to detect the different chemicals in sweat. <laughs> and there's the second component, and that's where we can process the information, we can analyze the data, and we can also transmit the signal to a wireless, for example, wireless uh, cell phone. Sweat is very complex. So we decided to target four different chemicals. Sodium, potassium, glucose, and lactate. By looking at the concentration of some of the electrolytes, like sodium and potassium, you can get information about dehydration. By looking at lactate, you can get information about muscle fatigue. So as your skin temperature changes, the output of the sensor changes. As part of this electronic board, we do have a processor chip, effectively a computer, that can simultaneously correct for this temperature change. The board is working now? So once we designed and fabricated and built our sensor, the question of course was what information can we obtain and, and how accurate it is. So we started trying to find collaborators on campus or off campus. Just one day in my office I was Googling exercise physiology at Berkeley. And just like that, the, the first head that I get is Exercise Physiology Lab at Berkeley, led by George Brooks. It was really exciting to see somebody on campus taking uh, an idea and measuring important metabolites in a body fluid uh, in real time, in a transportable, miniaturized way. It's just fantastic. What we did was to have people exercise for different times at different intensities under different conditions and we were able to show how well the device worked. A medical technician could get a reading on somebody instantaneously and then follow that instead of taking a blood sample and then sending that to a laboratory and waiting several hours for a result. It's the beginning of I think of a great new realm in, in biosensing. Not only for personal use, but for astronauts. People who need to be monitored for this or that condition in real time. All the values are within the normal range. Yes. I'm very excited about this work. This technology can be used in the future uh, as a way of uh, getting useful information about health in real time. And it's all done uh, using a platform that is uh, just on the back of the watch. I think that it's helpful to understand some concrete examples. 
So if we look at this chart, obviously um, dehydration has an impact on performance. The more uh, water the body loses, the more sodium the body loses, different um, micronutrients the body loses, the less effective we become athletically. Um, also, so how does that practically apply to athletes? We can see that dehydration uh, results in dizziness, fatigue, headaches. It could actually cut your capacity to perform by 45%. And I would actually say from personal experience that when we become too overcome with dehydration or overheating, it can make you completely unable to perform at all. So that really goes to an overall impairment of your entire performance. So on the more sophisticated end, we can look at how this can be applied to professional sports. So these athletes, they, they know their capabilities, they know what limits they can be pushed to, but still, as we see here with LeBron James, one of the most famous and best athletes in the world, he suffers with problems with overheating, with dehydration, and other, um, other symptoms because of being a, unable to monitor in real time exactly how his body is functioning. So it's clear that he has the top doctors in the world, or top you know, level doctors in the world, looking at him, trying to make predictive <coughs> measurements on what he's going to need throughout a basketball game in order to perform at the highest level. But it's clear that that's just not enough because you can look at what he's doing, you can say, okay, well, his levels of potassium, sodium may be increased during the game. Maybe he needs to drink more gasoline. Maybe he needs something like higher sodium. But that's all predictive. This is in time, and in a sport like basketball or any other sport where you return to the bench periodically throughout the game, they can take real in-time analysis of what's going on. And the reason that's important is because once the effects of dehydration set in, it takes some time for your body to react and actually overcome the symptoms. It's not just you have the best sport or you have the Gatorade and all of a sudden you feel ready to go again. It can take a half hour to an hour and by that time, the game's already over. So it would be incredible if they could prevent this, these types of um, these types of things from happening to begin with. But it's not just basketball or, or sports like that. It's interesting, we just have to go to France. In sports like this, where there are no regular stoppage in play, or they're just continuously, the athlete is continuously on the road, or even in running, or if you're if you're running for your own personal pleasure or your own personal sport rather than competing. You're on your own, you're pushing your physical capabilities to the max, you're pushing your mental capabilities to the max, focusing on the sport that you're engaged in. However, if you had this type of technology on a Fitbit or just on your wrist or even in a sweatband, you would be able to not have to focus on thinking how your body feels. You could focus on the task at hand, which is the sport. And you could have the a monitor or a sensor tell you, okay, I need more of a, I need more liquid. I'm going to start to feel the symptoms of dehydration and it's going to impair my performance. And even in soccer, in some, in some countries or in some leagues, they have the referee not only calling the game, but also monitoring players during the game, especially in very hot climates to make sure that the players are safe and the conditions are okay for them to continue to perform. But with this type of technology, we could have all the players linked to an independent trainer who is monitoring players on an individual basis, and then you could have the referee focus on their main task, which is to call the game. And on top of it, the players would have better physical, individual assessment in real time throughout the game, which would make the entire overall play safer. And finally, it's not just professional athletes that can benefit from this, but children are at a higher risk for dehydration. So sometimes young children do not know their capabilities, they do not know what their limits are, and they can be overcome with heat or dehydration or something that can affect them and make them feel very sick. I know I used to work as a camp counselor when I was a teenager, my first job, and a few times a week, if not every day, there would be at least one child that was playing around outside and had to come in because he was just not feeling well, maybe too much sun exposure, too much heat. And that's, that's a scary situation because it's just me and a bunch of other teenagers that are watching these kids with a few adults that none of us are doctors. The kid doesn't know what's wrong with them. We don't know what's wrong. We may have to call the parents, get them involved. It's, it's a big ordeal. However, if we had something to say, you know, we could link this to 
your device, your cell phone, and just scan its wrist and say, okay, well, your blood sugar levels are low, or your sodium levels are low, we need this and you'll be okay, rather than having to be scared that it could be something worse than it actually is. And I actually have personal experience with this, where um, I think I was about 13 years old, I was on vacation with my family, and I was playing beach volleyball, and out of nowhere, I got very tired, very sick, and started getting nauseous, and I had no idea what was wrong with me. Luckily, one of the people I was playing with, his father was helping keep score with us, and he was an EMT. So he was able to diagnose me right away, he said, you're dehydrated, you can sit in the shade, you need to have a Gatorade, um, you'll be okay in about a half hour. But as a 13 year old, if I wasn't lucky enough to have an EMT around, there's no way I could have known. I, I might have not have gotten a drink, I might have stayed in the sun, who knows, maybe he, maybe he could have turned into something worse. But I was lucky enough to have the EMT there, so he kind of took the place of the wearable here, but maybe he would be so lucky in the future. And while it's very interesting to look, going back, looking at the professional application of what these, um, of what these sensors, these biosensors can do for us, it's even more exciting to look at how it can help everyday people, especially kids that may not know how their body is reacting or experiencing it for the first time. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, health preventing diseases. Um, going into a little about the dehydration we saw in 2003 in Europe, a uh, big heat wave actually killed a lot of people, a lot of older people. Um, and this kind of thing could help in certain ways. Uh, people don't know how much more they consuming is actually uh, able to be kind of issue. Um, I'm gonna talk a little about my diabetes and one of the things I'm gonna say is glucose. So diabetes, diabetes is a rising uh, disease that uh, is getting worse and worse than not only in the United States but in China as well. Uh, this is uh, increase of, of course, sugar and food, but um, with this advice, we could, we could see the pre-diabetic uh, phase of, of the disease <coughs> that's preventing, preventing from happening. Um, it would be more, uh, it would be less than invasive procedure than actually going to block the blood. And we would actually get it in real time. So you would actually have your glucose and levels on that period instead of actually having to take a sample of blood maybe in the morning or afternoon, but you would have it when it actually increases and rises. Um, that's my daughter. Aww. <laughs> uh, so actually, uh, during pregnancy, it was, uh, it was a nightmare. It was not bad. No, she has more hair. Uh, no, actually, uh, uh, during pregnancy, uh, as a couple, you become very worried about what's going on in the body. Uh, every time my wife would say voice, I would freak out. Thought I was going to go to the hospital right away. Uh, uh, and, and you know, reading about the information that is on the internet, I can not say it's better for me to be here. I'm like, you do that. Get your partner to do it. Uh, and uh, and actually, we were we had some issues with a lot of hiccups, which is small, but there was just a lot of it. And we, because we couldn't go, we couldn't figure out in real time 
see a future where this device can actually be connected to the self driving car. Um, if you have a heart attack or you have a stroke or any disease during you're in the car, this would automatically be detected and actually make sure that the car will drive to the nearest hospital. So that way you can instead of going home and not to lay home, this would maybe help help the person actually have a better chance of surviving. Um, And drones going in uh, on drones. Uh, so far, I think one day they can pick up dogs, but hopefully one day they're big enough that they can actually carry human beings. So, uh, if you, for example, did have some kind of medical condition, something that would have happened in, in the future, maybe you would have drones that can actually fly towards where you're located actually pick you up and take you to the hospital. Or, if it's big enough, the drones can actually be a viable hospital. Uh, this is just imagination, but hopefully, hopefully we'll see something like that. So, as we can see, this is something that directly affects everybody. Um, we all have bodies that we need to take care of and I expect all of us want to have healthy bodies, want to catch things before they actually affect us. For example, I had a, when I was really young, I had a friend that died because of a undetected heart condition. He might be alive today, had a, well, had one of these devices and they detected this condition immediately. So it's something that we all should be wanting and if we keep going on this uh, technology, it could be really groundbreaking in the future. So, as we said already, sweat is much less invasive to monitor than blood. We don't need to use any needles to grab it. Uh, only problem is, as of right now, it's less accurate than blood because it's a blood is more chemically controlled than your sweat is. So your measurements, they, they need to do a lot more testing to figure out if they're getting accurate information from it. And however, with sweat, you get a lot quicker results. I've gotten blood tests before, they've taken five vials of blood for me, and I waited for two weeks to figure out if there's anything wrong with me. Uh, so I can get that immediately. I immediately thought of, from our accounting class, it's like a case of relevance versus faithful representation. Anyway. Uh, another issue is that we're not always sweating, obviously. I mean, a little bit, yes, but it might not, we might not get enough sweat for it to actually be able to measure us when we need it, and they're still doing some research right now. They might actually be able to find ways to um, measure sweat to figure out um, mental health as well, not just physical health. And there is a potential right now for measuring more than just sweat. For example, body fluids from the ill and the injured to help cure them. And if this kind of technology really uh, goes in a year and forward, we might be able to see a future without needles. Well, for blood tests. We came up with a few discussion questions to move a little. Um, so, as we know, there's no give without the tape for technology like this. So, for example, what should we do about data being sent over to third parties for directly to medical professionals? Should stuff like this require, require consent? And how does the Fourth Amendment come into play for something like this? So what do you guys think? Does this require consent to go to your doctor, or should doctors have access to this you know, by virtue of them being a physician? When you go to the doctor and you sign those forms, you sign a form giving access to this data. So you could have access to the data when you go to the doctor, so you go back and you could transmit the data from your phone and to be able to scan yourself and show them, all right, this is what I have. You, you, oh. find, you find all this correct, you learn it from the class. Oh, okay. uh, the date and the fit date doesn't belong to you, it belongs to that. Mm -hmm. right. So I would imagine the model would be the same, although I think this is the design. At the same time, if more um, wearable technology like this starts breaking ground, or just the fit and other stuff too, we might be having more of a discussion about whether this data should be sent over to them, whether it belongs to them or it belongs to us. I mean, I would just, it's a big 
assumption that this kind of data is not like as not as important security wise, like how much salt is in your body at any given time, is like not necessarily something that I don't think people are as concerned about as what your fingerprint is. Um, but it, I didn't also assume it's sort of a thing like when you have an iPhone that like you opt in to everything when you get whatever device this is and therefore whatever so that it, it yeah <laughs> but that's your own point yeah, um, so see the, the benefit of it is that it's always checking up on you so that you can tell in real time so you're not giving it to experts in the time but there are two issues for example you can look at healthcare if you have some kind of condition, you're possibly very I actually wonder, really, I have been arguing for a continuous auditing service that the, the firm will charge for continuous monitoring. And uh, maybe doctors can charge. Obamacare, or software, for monitoring, automatic monitoring of Wi-Fi 
by your or, or uh, yes. communication about it itself. It's definitely to see ways for this to be another wearable device that can attach to a bit of a like you said, turn on or start down. The Bluetooth with the telephone, the telephone, wireless to the location. So would you guys buy one of these? We like that. We all like that.
CA is just for the term in files, the application of actual internal audit tests on an ongoing basis. The test field can vary from quarterly to monthly, but the procedures are performed in a continual fashion designed to get as close as possible to the transaction processing. We actually, at the lab, didn't think that could be monthly or quarterly. We want the kind of very real time, close to real time, maybe overnight, but not much there. And several things we did since then, it's our bank, where they overnight type of things. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, this is the reason why the survey, the PWC survey, when they talk about 65% of the companies are doing continuous audit, that's the reason, because they are, uh, the interpretation of continuous audit is an audit that repeats a few times a year. Okay, but actually, this is actually, this idea is a internal audit uh, is not really tied to the external audit like schedule, but uh, audit by exception. What is an audit by exception? Sorry, it's an A. Uh, audit by exception is when you find variations of this type. So what we idealized in those days was uh, auditors would not perform mid-year and year-end type of tests. What they would do is wait for a lapse. And depending, and we had actually four levels of alarms. Depending on the level of alarm, you would intercede or not. Okay, and I'm going to show a couple of slides that talk about this. So what we do today is this kind of thing, assurance of report. So balance sheet is not okay. there, it's a report, you audit this report. Now what we could have all to, and I don't think uh, we are getting there, I think we're going to go in another direction, okay? You can basically assure processes, company has many processes, you do an examination of the process based on controls. And you could actually audit pieces of data. And so you have an XDRL piece of data here with attributes, year, dollars, etc., etc. One of them would be an expected level of error in this particular piece of data based on tests of the procedure. This was the ideas we had. Actually, Eric Cohen from PwC, who just retired, uh, wrote a paper, and we talked a lot about how to level of assurance, and he's still talking about it. But now this is actually uh, where we see this today. We, we had this, uh, this chart he presented. Uh, in the Australian monography world. Um, but several things feed in the data. Automation, sensing of data, censoring of data, ERP is feeding the data, and electronic transactions. Okay, and what we did at the lab, you can see the slides, is a system we call continuous auditing. And what did it mean, continuous auditing? Was exactly this. We had a whole set of points of measurement and standards. And we progressively developed a whole set of methods of measuring it and looking for exceptions. And basically it was comparing the data with standards. Okay, we're going to come back to this and explain this a little bit more. Um, in 2003, uh, we got a visit from someone that's going to be your professor next summer, Rob Venner. 
he was at Siemens at that time. He did here in Ireland a couple of years ago. So. And he was head of the whole Siemens America. He said, oh, it's just America. Siemens America at that time was a $22 billion company. Very large company. And he said, you know, we have about 200 instances of SAP. Everyone knows what SAP is, correct? See, now if you don't, do you know what SAP is? Yes? No? Say, say, I don't know. Before I start talking about it, uh, there are these things we call ERPs, Enterprise Resort Planning Systems. And what these are, they're integrated information systems for a company. So a company buys ERPs, they are getting a database, and they are getting payroll, cost, uh, human resources, etc., all everything together. Okay, and the biggest one of these is a German company called SAP. Second biggest one is Oracle. Okay, and what this is is a huge software system that manages everything that the company does. Guys, please ask if you don't know something. Don't. It's not stupid to ask. It's stupid not to ask. Okay? Really do ask because it's important that, that you understand this. So the, and most modern systems are developed around ERPs. Okay, let me just say a little bit more about this. In the old days, systems were like this, your company had payroll, and payroll had some pays. And then you had cost, and cost had some pays. And then the data here and the data here didn't match. I ran the data center for Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. It was my first job after I got my PhD. I had to go back to Brazil for two years. And there we had these COBOL with the programs. And all those papers, all the center. And then for the university, you had registered office. What is a registered office? Then figure out what courses you are taking and etc. etc. Then they had bursar's office that collected who paid and who didn't pay. Normal, correct? Right? But they were like this, separate. Uh, I had this idea and I merged the two files. I said they should be the same, correct? Right? We had about 40% of the students didn't pay. And about 10% of the students paid, but they were not registered. Okay, so this was a big, big thing there. And uh, I called, uh, I asked uh, my boss there, was a Hungarian like me, uh, Jesuit, great guy, uh, one of the best people I ever met. And he didn't know what was happening. And finally, you know, we had this meeting with Jesuits and Minister, no one could figure out on that. Until one of my TAs that said, I said, this is, this is Father Petsch. And I said, what? Father Petsch, that was a community uh, priest, okay? He was in charge of the religious upgrading of the students. Turned out, he used to give a lot of tuition away. So you yeah, we went there and said, oh boy, I don't have money, so anyway. Maybe the situation is not like it. Okay, that was slow. A couple of thousand a year or something like that. And, uh, and so, you know, I had to kind of go and say, well, Father Petsch was a safety man, I really like him. But I have to say that. And the 10% of people that are paying and they were not registered, they actually, women that got married, or misspellings, and etc., etc. But what this illustrates is that these separated systems uh, actually had duplicate data, had a lot of problems with data. Just because I raised your curiosity, the problem was resolved by a meeting among the Jesuits, and they fought all night long, and then at the end they punished them to me, they made, created a committee to figure out who really was waived of tuition and who was not. And they started by unwaving everyone. 
Okay, and then we went to this whole thing. Then you will see a video of a car at that time. So he has a car, how can he not pay? His car is a congressman, how come he doesn't pay? And so this was, uh, and they all knew, they knew a lot of the students, and was, uh, and I was in that committee, which was pretty miserable being on that committee. Uh, but anyway, they finished up settling between themselves and we cleaned the, cleaned the database off and was was exactly solution to the problem. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, this happened, uh, meaning this was, I'm not going to tell you what here, but a long time ago, okay? And what hap started happening uh, when we got many years later is that this idea of the year 2000 was going to come. And the year 2000 was the Y2K problem. And you probably remember this. Okay, you are nearly five years old at that time. Okay, Y2K. And it was a very simple problem. Here is 99. So you compare with that, it's 98. So track onto the other, that's a positive number. But when the year became zero, zero, the subtract didn't work. And so uh, uh, Professor Student here, okay, was for he used to teach managerial accounting. He's a heavy guy, a fantastic guy. And Student told me, don't go to Brazil for the New Year's Eve of 2000 because there might, the Russian nuclear plants might explode because of the year 2000 and the radiation will get there fast. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, strange ideas about year 2000. But actually, uh, the basic story about year 2000 is that all the systems were developed, or many of these systems were file-oriented systems, not integrated. They had problems with a lot of incorrect data duplicated, like uh, married name and unmarried name in one and in the other, or misspellings. It's always a big problem. And the thing that people didn't realize in these early years of computing is that computing is like a building. You need to maintain it. If you don't maintain your computing and update it, social security is uh, in Brazil changed the number of digits. Here, zip code went from five to nine. Okay, so there's a lot of these changes happening. But they used uh, the Y2K problem to actually move to Oracle, SAP, and et cetera, et cetera, and invest where they needed to invest. And so by the year early 2000, most large companies, like what is then already in the study, and like 495 of the five, Fortune 500 had ERPs at that time. Okay, so there's, uh, that's kind of big, about 35% of the market was SAP, finish up that Oracle bought PeopleSoft and JD Edwards, and they become bigger but not bigger than SAP. And so these two guys here occupy like 70% of the market. And other thing to know about, about uh, ERPs is that once you start an ERP, is you don't want to get out of it. It's a big investment to start it. You know who made the big, big bucks out of this was the CPA firms. Because all the CPA firms created uh, consulting and they were selling consulting to their clients. So uh, I, I go to him and say, you, you know, your systems are terrible, have bad data, but I can install your SAP. So the, the big five at that time actually uh, were selling consulting services to install SAP, to install Oracle. So they bought Oracle, or the company bought Oracle, and they did the consulting services. And the companies love that because next audit opinion will be clean because you're not going to gong your own opinion, but your own company, correct? Mm -hmm. And when, uh, and so it became the biggest business of most of the CPA advisors were installation and maintenance of ERPs. And when 
uh, analog pathogens and world compound. Um, basically, they saw to look at Enron, and Enron was paying Anderson $24 million for audit and $25 million for consulting services. And at that time, Anderson and its consulting services, Ascension, were on a divorce situation. Because what was happening, what's happening is that principals, principals are the partners with our CPAs of consulting, were making more money than the audience. So the principals, the people from Accenture, now Accenture, at that time Anderson Consulting, they didn't want to support the audit. They want to go off and make more money. And so there was a lot of attribution to consulting of errors in audit. So when the crisis happened, uh, Anderson went bankrupt uh, because of criminal prosecution and uh, etc. Uh, and I have a long story, but I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I'm just uh, basically Sarai Shostak came in and said, you are not allowed to sell consulting services to your clients. And he said, you can sell tax services and a couple of other things, I think. but you couldn't sell consulting services. Mm -hmm. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Mm -hmm. Bad idea? Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> you, get, you guess what I was going to say, don't they? <laughs> so all about now, you're thinking about now. At that time what happened is of the first Anderson went down. And then of the big four, three of them got rid of their consulting services. Ian White sold it to Gat, Gemini, etc. The lawyer came. These are the seven. And the rule was you can consult today on non-clients. And what had happened since then is then they kind of realized, you know, we are one out of four. We don't dominate 90% of the business. Uh, so the, the ones that the others audit, we can consult to them. So they rebuild their consulting. And at this stage, I think the numbers are that 65% of the business of the CPA firms is consulting, and 35% is audit. And uh, there is a lot of worry that they are going to go 90 10. And remember that it's uh, problematic. Why? Because if consulting is more profitable, Audit it. Why would you want to audit the firm if you can consult it? And so obviously there is a. And actually, what I was going to say that he preempted me here is that I, I think that in first instance, I was a big supporter of that change. And in retrospect, what he did is de technologize the audit. The people, the guys, those partners, those principals there working with the auditors, made the auditors more technological, more able. And now I think they became less technological. And of course there is the 90 or 65, 35 problem that has not been resolved. And the other phenomenon I started noticing, I met several guys, and I think this guy from KKMG that's going to visit her, no, from PWC will visit her uh, today. So now, actually what was the story is, you are, a cons you are a partner, audit partner, and then because you make money, you move to become a principal. No, I'm really not moving to being a partner, but you move to advisor. And the other thing that I think is happening, and this is just my imagination here, what I think it is happening is that uh, one thing that annoys me a lot is because I care for you guys. And it annoys me a lot that now the firms, every of the firms, brags that they're hiring all these data scientists instead of my students. Okay, that really annoys me. Although you guys have a lot of problems because this is a high, 
I don't know who did it. At least last year once. And uh, so they say that for the law of automation, I think they're having the same number of audits more than this. And uh, so I don't think you're going to have a legal problem here. But that annoys me. Here it is. And annoys me for two reasons. One is because of the CPA exam. Why? Because the CPA exam is kind of uh, my typical question. What does a student need to know in the age of Google? Does he need to memorize all professors from Mellow's Don't tell me that. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, no, and I think what the half-life of the knowledge is two and a half years. So in five years, you're going to forget 80% of those things. As well. And when you need the more inclusive rules and more complicated rules, is when you are managing. Because then you are putting things together and doing adjust, uh, reviewing, adjusting entries, etc. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. And I always tell, um, I tell when I talk to bodies and etc. I say, I'm teaching in class audit, and I start teaching audit analytics. And then Isabel raises her hand and says, Professor, is this is the CPA exam. And I say, no. And immediately the interest disappears. No one wants it. <laughs> and then I go to the CPA guys. And last year I had one of the guys here, he were alum out of hours, talking about the CPA. And maybe I'll get him to come, but I don't want to use our class time. I'll have to use Professor Sedano's class time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, and, and then I go to them and say, um, and they say, why don't you put analytics in the exam? You know what they say? Students don't know. So it's a double lie. The students don't want it because not in the CPA exam. And the exam guys don't put it because you guys don't know. And it's an aggravating factor. Aggravating factor is that the way they design the exam. Every five, six, seven years, depending, they do a survey. And the survey studies what first and second year staff do. And they gear the exam into them. What a way to prepare a profession. Prepare them for the first two years. So I really don't like that. They're now moving the exam to more critical thinking. But they have to grade it automatically. So how, how much critical thinking can, can you expect? So I made a suggestion. The, when we visited there. We did, I, I went with the high person of the ICTA to visit the city example, and I suggested, I'll give you 100 questions, and you post it, and give it to all the backers of the world, people that have the city example, and say, in one year we're going to ask analytics. That will make people start paying attention to analytics. Yes or no? Yes. Then they immediately told me NASA is not going to allow me to do that. There are 54 NASA state boards of accountancy. NASA is the National Association of the State Boards of Accountancy. How can there are 50 states? How can there are 54 NASA boards of accountancy? I don't understand that. I have to figure that out. Wow. So I last three months, Professor Abi and Professor Hussein went to talks with NASA. Okay, I presented the paper in, I went to Idaho. Do you know how long it takes to go to Idaho and come back? <laughs> okay, and then to say the lucky one did it here in World Island and I was in Spain. Uh, but I got an email about a week ago from one person person asking me for 30 questions on analytics. And she's writing a paper discuss this issue. I think they, 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 they was important. I was very surprised. I had, I had no expectation. I went to Idaho not to have me. It was five, long five, etc. But uh, maybe something will change. But so now you know what an ERP is. Yes? Kind of? Okay, kind of is good for, for this discussion. And so Rod Brennan came to me and said, guys, we have about 200, 200 versions of SAP, meaning they have all the subsidiaries, and each subsidiary runs on, a, on an SAP, okay, independent. And we only audit this thing every two years. What can we do about this? 
verbessert. Okay. And what was doing the thesis, PhD thesis, on homology university professionals can do for all courses. And so we worked on this thesis and created this thing we call CCM, continuous control monitoring. And it's a very same concept that, as we have here. We designed a baseline. What is a baseline? These are the controls in SAP that we need to have. And these are the parameters of it. And then we took a measurement, they wrote a program, to com and then we compared one by one the controls. And about 25% to 30% of the controls were compared. And so we created this methodology we call CCM. And actually both the ACL and IDEA, the two audit softwares, actually after the the technology, the trouble that we are getting patterns on it. Based on our work, we published this paper, uh, Rod, me, and Professor Kogelberg. And Professor Alex. Professor Alex, yes, Alex. Um, and then we kind of start to say, well, all the continuous auditing is now control monitoring and continuous audit. So what did we do? We changed the name because now continuous audit thing is these two things together. So we change the name to CDA, continuous data audit, and continuous control monitor. And people are always ask me the following question about this, which seems to be intuitive but it's not. The question is if you have real good controls, why do you need to look at the data? Correct? The, the, the fact is that you can have as many controls as you want, you don't know if you are covering the problems that could happen with the data. Okay, it's like you never know if you are being hacked, exactly. You never know if there are viruses in your computer that have never been detected. So you need to do data monitoring and you need to do control monitoring. And so, and then recently, uh, we started because the PCOV has been asking for asking for risk-based audit. What does it mean a risk-based audit? Audit where you emphasize your big risks. And is that and uh, that's a way to control for costs in the audit, not to audit things that you don't really need to audit. So that, so we created, the, we started arguing for this methodology, the CRMA methodology. Uh, we were thinking of putting an A in the middle, call it karma, but we <laughs> finished up with CRMA, okay? And this, the idea behind this is that you look at the risk profile and then do a planning around, based on the risk. And so now the continuous audit in our, in our TV published in, in a book and etc. etc. is these three elements. And uh, Moon's dissertation, that you move dissertation is actually using social media to monitor certain types of risk. Really cool, cool dissertation where we actually I think about other CRMA studies, correct? And then uh, yes. Can you add another another one into you tell me. Maybe cyber security. Not a bad idea. <laughs> I won't pay you out of but maybe. Um, did I send you my, our cyber security study? Yes. With Hussein? Yes. Yeah. I don't think they have it. Uh, no? I don't think so. Send it again. No cost sending it. Okay. Uh, sometimes that actually might not be a bad idea putting cyber security here. The other thing we have been talking about here is what we call exogenous measures. What is exogenous measures? It's auditing without going to the client, using big data to audit without going to the client. This kind of modern problem, say this to the, to the recruiters because they won't understand and they'll think that you're not sick. Okay, but we, we are kind of... Uh, talking about that, exactly just putting an article together about that. I talked about that to the PIOB, I talked about that to the PCAOB, and they are, they are interested in the idea of using big data as a form of evidence. They haven't quite 
formalize that, but they are, they are interested. You know, what, uh, one thing that occurs to me is maybe after you have Professor Helen now, in auditing, I'll ask Helen to give me one or two of her classes and come back and talk about this a little bit more about emerging. We work with Helen all the time. And so this is actually things that we have done in the car lab. Uh, uh, that work that we did in the HCA work that I was talking before, uh, actually I went back, I didn't finish the story because I went back to KPMG after they had killed the project itself, and said now we have data from HCA. And they were very good, they immediately, in three weeks we had event. Okay, they were excellent. And they funded us for 10 years just monitoring what we are doing. And after that, and recently, we have been doing whole set of projects with KTMG that helps them at the moment. We are doing, as we talk, we are working on a couple of projects with them. Um, and these are, uh, this was the AT&T project. This is the project I mentioned uh, with HCA. Okay, this is a clustering project. Here, here a little bit about that. Process mining, predictive. Uh, these are all things, and probably a couple of them. I don't have this. And uh, this is quite old, we have much more circles here, but these are companies that we had projects uh, in these three areas. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the AT&T project because it's the easiest to visualize. And I want you to pay attention to this and think how would we do this today with the technology we have. This was done from 86 to 90. The World Wide Web did not exist. Okay, we did have email. Okay, and you're going to hear some things about me. So I was in Columbia until 84. In 85, I left Columbia for a year in the and went to Bell Labs. And then I stayed there until 89, when I came here, because I found myself teaching PhD students at night. And I said, well, that's what I And then uh, Bell Labs wasn't too happy with me leaving because I was doing some projects for them. So I finished up working with Bell Labs and about here for the next five years. In just about four years I retired from, from Bell Labs and I'm full, fully here. But we had a car lab start at the next step. Okay, so these are the concepts uh, that we published on the 91 paper, the first paper. And metrics are basically measurements that you make. Okay, analytics are basically a rule, right? If, it's, uh, if this is larger than standard per variance, give me an alert. And those are, we had a lot of, we had hundreds of these analytics. Some of them were graphical analytics. Some of them were very simple. This was this, it was that. Nothing particularly complicated. But was totally distributed to the middle of 18. And uh, we did it in about four years. We built this thing. Uh, and uh, we had standards of operation and of variance. Uh, a large order of And there's one interesting thing technological. There are many interesting. At that time, this was no lab. You, you build your things. You didn't copy things from anywhere, etc. But we did it. We did I, I, I didn't like the idea of making something when we had it ready. And so we, we actually discovered uh, what happened is, is the following. I got there in 85. And I had the fact and he was a partner at Coopers and Lyman, PWC Coopers, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, okay? And he was a partner at PWC. And when I started teaching at USC, he was a partner in, in Coopers, Los Angeles. And I started teaching IT audit. I had no idea what IT audit was. Okay, but he, they said, oh, you know about computers, you teach this thing, because Dick Savage is making a leave. So what I did, I invited the partners 
in charge of my key audit of each one of the big eight at that time to come and talk to my class. Okay, and then uh, I made friends with them, and this one, this guy called Bob Kafka, who was my buddy, uh, and you know, he came to talk to my class a bit, and, and he had kind of complicated technical problems, he would give me a call, because we love technical problems, correct? <laughs> uh, and so we became good friends. And uh, he was the partner of, he moved from Los Angeles to New York. He actually helped me because he made a phone call to my wife from Los Angeles to New York in Coopers. I think they got transfer there anyway, but he was helpful. Okay, my wife was in Coopers at the time. Um, and, uh, and so when I started the Bell Labs, when, when I started, went to Bell Labs, I said, Bob, what should I do here? And Bob says, oh, internal audit needs help, go and talk to So I went to talk to him, but very highly recommended by the CFO. And, uh, and they deferred, and then he said, do a study, see what you should do there. So typical academic, I interviewed, I organized my study, etc. and I came out with three findings. Okay, my first finding was, there are 300 and something auditors here, no computers. Let's do something about this. My second finding say use analytics. And my third finding was you have some very large systems that no one understands. This is very dangerous. Because already at that time I had heard these rumors that, uh, that 20% or 30% of all telephone calls that get there. But anyway, I went there talking with people, I heard all the rumors, right? So they actually were very interesting. This never happened to me in other, time, in other places. First, they said, forget about computers. And they had, they had PC department called Conversion Technology. Computer, they had bought a computer company. In about two months, they had a PC in everyone's desk. They were fantastic. Analytics, they had no idea what was going on. Uh, even after my explanation, they continued without the rest of my but the third one, this with large systems, they had already problems. And they had very much problems to identify. So they empathized with that. And the head of the internal audit at that time, Dr. Bruce Barr, was a smart guy. And we bought recommendation, or kind of recommendation. Uh, we decided to work on that. So I asked them and said, I want to do a method to all the time audit, <coughs> audit, systems, because I was kind of kept it wrong. Uh, I, while I was at USC, I got a copy of Tush Ross, the Lloyd and Tush, the Lloyd, Tush Ross's computer audit package. At that time, the eight firms, each one had a computer audit package. It was called Strat. Okay, I have like brand new PhD, Strata. I learned, learned how to use it. My students were all using it. I had to in IP audit class. And uh, so I rewrote Slack in a language called the ETL, interactive language. So Slack was card based, I do it with terminals. Basically, it looked like the card, but was with the terminal. They had about 50 universities adopted it, and that's a big waste of time, Andrea, in terms of publication. Don't do that. Okay. Uh, but I, I rewrote this thing and went around with Australia presenting. It was great. It was fun, but not very good for my publication. Um, so I did that when I was at USC. And then I went to Columbia, took that with me. And when I left Columbia, I had stopped doing that thing and I went to, to do uh, this Bell Labs project. But I had all these ideas about how to compute a lot. And one of the ideas was monitor the systems and create analytics that pick up things up. So, and you know, the people talk about innovation, very innovative thing, but nothing particularly new. You know, it's just one little idea here, another idea there. You're working with, I had four guys with PhDs working with me. 
I was the only business guy. There were one was a statistician, the other one was computer science, the other was industrial engineer, and Fern was uh, was she studied the Gulf of Mexico. It was an oceanographer, but she but she knew spectral analysis. Fern very smart, very smart. So Fern and me were one. First paper was published uh, by Sven and Kaufman. Uh, but we had a little here, a little there, etc. Uh, a whole set of ideas. But, but the first thing I ask AT&T is give me a small system, I'll create a monitoring system for you. And they gave me the biggest system they had. They had, uh, they had developed uh, this thing called uh, ICANN, Residential Customer Account Management System. And that was key to their strategy of what they call take back, because AT&T is split into AT&T and seven operating on the rise of the and etc. And the switches of telephone went to the operating companies. So they didn't have a way to direct to the client because the switches were with the, with the operating company. So they wanted to create a billing system that built separate, so they knew who the clients were and they could market them. But you know, you you know, I couldn't really argue too much with it because that's what they wanted that. But there was a problem. This system was costing them a billion dollars to develop. Okay, there are 142 switches, and they needed infrastructure for it and etc. And there were like 5,000 change requests. Change requests they were written, I think, it in COBOL, the primary language. And every time you needed something to be improved, you have to write a change there. So it could ask a change to take two years for them to do. So it was complicated. And so we fi I finished up with this methodology. You know, need is a mother of invention, what we call measure. And the idea was the following. AT&T had uh, these data centers, four very large data centers. And the data center were connected to the different parts of AT&T. And at that time, what they did is they sent by wire reports on how to run the billing system, things that they needed, the site to pay, the this, to that, and et cetera, et cetera. So what we did, we captured those electronic reports. And then we screen scraped them, what we call screen scraping. We just kind of text mine out of it the data we needed. And this was done in Unix, program each thing individually. Uh, it was a real, not the best way to do this, but you didn't need a change request. The only thing they needed to change is when they had a program that they were going to run that we needed the output of the report, put a card in it saying, send it to Ombe. Ombe was the, the hub of AT&T Bell Labs. Ombe, you know where Ombe is. It's in the south, it exits 105, I think, of the high of the Garden State. Um, so they had a copy there. And so they would print things, and a copy of it was available there electronically. So we wrote, uh, we picked up that report and sent it to my son workstation here in Mauritius. Okay? And uh, so it was like an email. Okay, pick up the report to Miklos and send it to me. We crashed the entire network of, of email of their labs. Okay, because we are sending huge amounts of information. 10 megabytes in the morning, 6 in the afternoon. We crashed everything. If it was any other company, I would, I would be big fun. This was their labs. The, the manager at the, at the hub in Homeville, I was offended by the whole thing. He said, this cannot crash. Okay, first he yelled at me for using mail, which I used to do UCP, Unix to Unix communication protocol. But then he fixed it. Okay, created a bigger buffer, passed it out. So in you know, about less than a week, things were working pretty well. And so then we picked up each one of these reports, and we scraped out the data out of it, and created relational database. We didn't buy one. We didn't make one bomb. They actually had the one, but we didn't use it. Uh, so we used a thing called Adalas. 
But once uh, it was very interesting doing all these things, so what happened, the report arrived, the whole mail jumped over to my PC, which was this guy, was a, was a Sun workstation, and my workstation saw the name of the report and did the extraction would be in order. So that, that was the way we did it, and that's why we called it measurement and report. We just to say the rest of the story, um, we did it when we finished it four years later. Typical Bell Labs would do a post mortem. And a post mortem, the big scientists from different areas look at what they did and criticize what they did. And they liked it, you know, it's totally unique. They have it, we're not doing anything like that. But they don't like it, they did like this. <laughs> they wrote this. Uh, uh, this report saying that you should have gone to the databases, collect the data yourself, and etc. Et By the time I retired from AT&T, they had 40 or 50 applications using measurement, what I call measurement. Because, you know, going into use a live application is crazy. You don't want to do that. Because you'll be blamed of destroying the system, and etc. And I learned that I never, in many projects we did, I never go directly to the machines. I pick up data and use it sample. Not to, not to create a lot of problems of being. Okay. Um, so we the definition, uh, we call it CPAS, continuous process audit. I would call it CPA, but my boss veto, so they say CPAS. Approach can be defined as philosophy of auditing that aims to monitor, kick off a process and continuous data in order to achieve audit by exception. So first I call the monitoring system and then say you want to achieve audit by exception. And what we actually did, Fern was fantastic, Fern Halper, she was fantastic. Happened that Fern was the doctor of the chief audit officer of Google's life. Only he was one of the other guys that I made friends uh, in, in my LA days. And his stand helper became not only head of IT audit, but he was uh, he was also finished up being head of the audit director at Google Salon. So very high profile. One day he called me up and said, you guys are Bell Labs, hired all these scientists. What? And I said, yeah, yeah we hired a lot of scientists. And he said, my daughter is oceanographer, can you hire her? So I had breakfast with her. The moment we sat down, I knew I was going to hire her. Smart, he knew a lot of spectral analysis we wanted to do, except the, except the dissertation was temperatures of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but Fern was not. And what Fern did in that effort was we call, what we call knowledge engineering. What is knowledge engineering? We were trying to find out what people were doing. Like what experience auditors examined when they looked at market. And so that's what Fern interviewed them. And you know, at that time, expert system was a big thing. Artificial intelligence at that time was expert system. And what you did is you talked with experts and then wrote code that represent what the, uh, what the experts do. And for about 10 years, experts were well, big in auditing, then disappeared, and now it's back. Big time, not exactly expert system, but that kind of thing. Okay, now it's because now computers can do that, and that time was very different. We put a lot of expertise in, in CFAX. Uh, but Fern went and interviewed more after the other auditors, and then a lot of people in the structure of at and building. Uh, there are programs that need to understand what the program did. So she talked to software engineers and the design flow charts and etc. She was very, very good. She was, not she, she's up. Okay. And so what we said is that this methodology will change the nature of evidence, time, procedures, and effort in order to we said this in 91, and still hasn't happened. But we hope it's going to happen soon. Now, one thing we are seeing now is several, many organizations creating a department of continuous auditors, and some of them are even doing everyday kind of exception. And that's starting to happen more. The thing that needs to be resolved, private, that we are taking here, uh, needs to be resolved is the business model to do this. 
So when you hear that guy from PwC talking about continuous auditing, he talks it for internal audit, not for external audit. And that's a big discussion that we have. There has to be a model whereby external auditors get paid to assure on a continuous basis. And that at this moment violates something. Maybe. Okay, so that's that's something that I don't think there's a lot of this kind of uh, objection to the fact that the continuous audit is an important thing. Now this is actually the the continuity equation thing that uh, we did at HCA. Okay, but what the, this was the first one. We didn't do it at, at HCA. This is the continuity equation model we did at AT&T. Just for you to see how you do these things. Okay, calls arrive and they are recorded in the tape in each one of the 142 switches. Then they downloaded every two hours the tape and they had the records. And those tapes were set by truck to the dot, to the four data centers, then split, put into the day of building. And then later with how much you charge for this and send and print it to the client. Okay. And so what we started with these equations that live like this to this to this to this. And you know, we, I started figuring out to do it this way. And and then uh, Andy Sherman worked in my team, he was a physicist. He said, we are doing continuous equations. We, do, we have been doing this in physics for decades. So we call it continuous equations. And basically, and in physics they look at, they link different states of the world in physics to equations. And so, uh, I didn't know I was doing and we finish up going and being a rocket scientist in one of the big financial firms. Now and then I hear from you. Um, and so this was, I had a presentation for airlines, and I was trying to convince them to give me data. So I proposed continuous equation of linking airline reservation databases with their flights, their billing, and their collections. I didn't go anywhere, but it was a good idea. And this is actually the architecture of the CPAS system. And there were four data centers. The reports arrived into Hongbyo. We filtered out the data into a relation database. And then using analytics, etc., we displayed it on the screen. And you could click on this thing and go down the different levels. This was done in hypertext. Just like you know today, but at that time we didn't invent hypertext, we copied it from someone in California that we had discovered. Uh, but what I like was click and pinning 86, very nice system. Uh, and this was in an operating system called Views, which was an operating system of the Sun workstations. Uh, what actually happened is that Years later, this was the platform it was used. Okay, so uh, and it was very, it's very cool. So they, and why did we guide the user interface to be flowcharts? Because that's what auditors do. They prepare. That's what their auditors certainly do. They create a flowchart and try to understand the data from this report goes here and etc. And what we did, we collected the data, put it in the initial amounts, throw away the reports. First thing they told us, don't throw the reports away we want them. Auditors are very in keep things. Okay? So we actually started accumulating large number of reports. We are processing over 100 reports um, a day. And, uh, but the data really was in the relation database, and we developed, and uh, Kazoo is our one was our industrial engineer, Stanford graduate, and what he used to do, he had an app, little, little Macintosh, and he would pick up the data by hand, type it in, into his Japanese, very obstinate, okay? Type it in, into his little Macintosh, and try and do the things that he liked. When 
hip hop, they handled it, it was good. We would ask someone else to program it into the into the real system. That's the way he liked to do it. How are you going to argue it? He was in bed with some paper and this. I actually don't know what it is. And actually this is a uh, this is a replication of what the system was. Remember, this was not the time of iPhone when you take a picture of the screen, correct? So actually this so this is a real screen that we had. And this is just an illustration of we counted how many trans transactions went for printing, 988 went for printing, we printed only 988, so we are missing 10. Yes. What is the problem? Can we like make it easier to like streamline it? This was the flow chart of the system. We couldn't change it because it was that's what the system was. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you drill down two or three times on this. We also wrote an interface that any auditor could build the gas, could really build a flow. And we tried it in, in another villa in, in Florida and it worked. So, uh, so uh, yes, this is complicated, but this is where the way the system was, and this is the way the auditors look at the system. They look at the system, uh, they were used to see this kind of things. You know, actually, we, from this was we called it an expert system because it had a lot of auditor rules in it. And there were rules saying, if you find this difference, call an alarm and etc. So there were a lot of these, this kind of, of, of things that we put in there based on what this firm discovered from, from the auditors. And it kind of built over the time. And, and this is actually a real story, I think. And part of analytics were things like this, just graphs. Like Lou was talking today, except the quality of uh, graphs at that time were very different. And this is actually an interesting story. Um, this graph shows percent of successful billing. So you sent 100,000 bills out, they had to be, the rule was 98% has to be successful. That was the standard that you're talking. And one day, this happened. And so when we got to here, we stopped it. We said something very bad is happening. And in retrospect, we discovered what happened. In retrospect, what happened is that an operator by mistake, we had to take twice. And he had this brilliant idea of multiplying the numbers by minus one and reading it once more to extract what he had read twice. Except that he created negative account numbers and horrible things like that. So this thing was, was going crazy. So we stopped the system. Azul noticed this call in the weekend and we stopped. Um, we stopped it, we figured out what happened. The system is done. Then I get a call from operation guys, furious at us. How did you stop the system? And they stopped feeding us the reports. And they blocked the reports. So I called Bob Camera and the reports came back very fast, like in 15 minutes. Okay. But then I got this call to go and visit him, the head of operations. And I was ready to be beaten up. So I biggest guys I could get to go with me I took them because I knew I was going to get help. And it started a little bit bad. But when he saw the report, what we had, he said, how do you get this? I don't have this information. I want it. I, I want this kind of things. I want to know what happened with our reports. So this was, I, I never saw the project so fast. In the morning, I was being yelled at. In the afternoon, it was a million dollar project for their labs. Okay, five MTS plus members of technical staff in one year. And, but the difficulty there was convincing the internal auditors that it was a good idea to give the same reports to operations. And I thought it was a good idea. The, more, the better information uh, they have, they will manage it better. They didn't think so. We finally compromised. Uh, we gave uh, uh, many reports. And uh, and some of them we kept, we kept 
and we help them we have keeping an adequate voice. Maybe the bigger level, higher level ones, we are keeping. And the other thing that interestingly developed is that over the years that we worked with them, or two years we worked with them, uh, those reports became much more specialized for them and for the auditors. They actually asked them something. They wanted the things like job sequencing, and crashes of reports, etc. The auditors are not interested on that. And so it turns out that we had two systems. We had Prometheus and we had CFAS running in parallel. Um, years later, I led, I just, we did a post mortem and, and I disconnected from it. I actually came to Rutgers and started working in tax mining at Bell Labs. And uh, uh, maybe three, maybe five years ago, I visited the living organization for another reason. And guess what? I found CPAS there. They had stopped the auditing system. They only kept Prometheus. They re-platformed it, but they didn't change anything. The same variable has everything. And I guess they couldn't program. And we didn't see. I guess that organization didn't have that thing, or didn't have a reason to do it. So actually, it was it's very nice to see that it's still being used for operational purposes. Auditors stopped using it because they had most information in Prometheus. So why, why did they need it? And this is actually the same report before we organized it, took out the weekend, and uh, uh, and we have all the different etc. Cetera, et cetera. And other interesting thing, you know, things never happen the way you expect. One of the major users of CPAS became training staff, training auditors, training an, an analysts, people that program it. Because it was so well, it was an expert system, it was well documented, and so you could, any screen you had, you could basically do this. And actually, this system here, was a demonstration system in in, uh, in Florida, in Boca Raton, that we have a, we let the auditors draw the chart. We firmly didn't do any knowledge engineering there. Let them do it. And we had written this software to draw graphics, and they put it together. No friend, I call the system was called RATS. Okay, um, this is the HCA project. And uh, Basically, what we try to do is relate ordering to receiving and to payment process. And we wrote equations, Professor Fogan wrote equations. This is the one that took us 10 years to publish. Okay? Uh, but in principle, it was a reasonably simple system. Uh, Alex, Professor Fogan, um, worked on this. And what we had is a, a data warehouse. What is a data warehouse? Is this big storage place that you put data when you don't want to use the data directly operationally. So they extracted the data and put that. And Professor Hogan could make heads or tails of that data. Turns out that the data in the warehouse was wrong. And Professor Hogan identified the Aston to redesign the data. It was still wrong, we designed it twice. At the end, you know, funny, interesting enough, you know, as you say, you never know what's going to happen. At the end, they like more the redesign of the warehouse than they like the auditing process. The auditing process, the process, uh, we did identify things that were wrong, they were fixed, and then the problems disappeared. The other thing that happened with HCA, um, they were, they became private. They saw in public, or they, they were bought by one of these, uh, hedge funds, okay? And so they have less interest on him. But they, they, uh, one of the guys that is still now advisory board still works about this is 15 years ago, something like that, 14 years ago. Uh, so we continue having a relationship with that. And this is actually developing the equations and et cetera. Okay, uh, this is actually the longest uh, group that we work with. And my slides are old because we have several other things that we've done with them, but they are still in process. And but the most interesting project I think we ever we had with them was still when they were only in the bank, not in the only bank. And you say, well, it's Brazilian bank. Uh, Brazilian bank have 1,400 branches. Okay. 
not as huge as they are now. Now we know the bunker has 4,000 branches. Okay? But they have 1,400 branches. And what they were doing at that time is auditing each one of the 1,400 branches. And so they had to hire other audit firms to give them labor to do these audits. And the audits were 120 hours audits. And this is required a Brazilian law. You have to audit every branch. And so that this wasn't uh, something cheap. And so that, that was really like one of our first projects. And what we did is we developed 18 indices of things that could be going wrong in the branch. And uh, every night you ran the process, meaning banks run the operations overnight. You know, you do the things during the daytime, and then at night they run the big batch processes. A lot of data going on. And even today, if you use Citibank or Chase, you get real time balances. But actually, that's just a calculation they do for your account. It's not a high big update that they are doing all the time. And so at the end of the night, we ran all these procedures, these 18 indexes on the branches, and came out with things like, uh, his credit limit is 10,000 reais. But today, he is 15,000 reais negative. Okay, so something happened there. The control didn't work. And actually, many of these systems have overrides. Why? Because Tom is the branch manager and looks at him and says, I don't know if I should trust him. But then he realizes that another account of a million, a million reais. Or I realize that he just deposits them without trading a Brazilian uh, government check for 20,000 reais. So there are many, many operational reasons that you violate the company. Of course, it could be that. He is paying Tom to override the It could be many different kinds of things. Um, uh, uh, actually, there was an interesting story. Um, in Brazil, when you pay your, your yearly taxes, called DAF, what you do is you pick up your, your return, go to the bank, pay the money to the cashier, and they stack your return and give you a little receipt. Why? Because you don't mail money over the mail over the mail in Brazil. Checks, because people see. It. Okay? And so what they have is this problem that cashiers will pick up that thing. Pick up the two thousand reais that he paid. Okay? And they would revert the transaction after the two thousand reais. So Finish, he finish up with a receipt, but the cashier put the money in the pocket because he referred the transaction. It took about two years for the Brazilian revenue service realized that it hasn't been paid. So they lost all the money with this. So what do we do? We wrote the little one of the 18 indices for reversals of that. But what we did was, it wasn't my idea, but it was pretty smart. Uh, we announced to everyone that we had. Next year, first year they had 400 reversals of that. that. Next year they had one. <laughs> and this one reversal was justified, it was a mistake. That was it. So, what, what, what did they learn here? It's one year's auditing, very interesting, uh, but also has a determined power. So I, I always, I, I, it took me a while to convince again the auditors to, to announce things that we are monitoring. But it was very good. It was very good. It finished up that we did, we were doing something like uh, 800 to 1,000 uh, checks. We were verifying things that gave alerts. About half of them we let them go, other half of them we actually escalated them, say there's something wrong. And in this case, when you do an up, all over, and accept it. I'm running out of time. So I just want to show you this. This is actually, this is the to total number of 
exception on others that we got on the day. And these were okay, and these were not okay. And when it was not okay, what did we do? We immediately, they, they had a little group of three people looking at these things. And when they found the variance, they went to the account of the client, maybe talked to the manager, figured out what happened. And sometimes they said okay, sometimes they didn't say okay. And if they said, did not say okay, they escalated, it, send it to the regional branch manager. And we always got responses from them, they tell the bank of the energy. And they claim that this thing saved them 10 times the cost of the system. Uh, we love this, this application. Uh, and I just want to illustrate one thing, and then I'll let you go to something next time. Um, you never know really what's going to come out of, of these things when you're doing research. And the bank loved this system. And when they merged with Itaú, the system died. And why did it die? Because the systems of Unibanco were too small to comport the 2,500 branches of Itaú, so they had to transport everything. And that Itaú, who did branch monitoring, was internal control, not all. So I went there, tried to sell the project, but no. But what was very interesting, and we wrote a suspicion function. And what is the suspicion function? Is an equation uh, with how many mistakes we found and the weight of the mistakes in each branch. And so we had a weighting of each branch each day. And then we oriented these reviews that they were supposed to do to the higher risk branches which was pretty nice uh, little derivative work out of, the, out of the original analysis of the data. And of course, uh, over time, we could have learned much more about what to do and accept or not in this case, because the system stopped. And, and next time, I want to tell you about the transitory account system. Okay, let's talk and let you go. I don't like it. And I will next time ask the market if you found any extra creative music of yours. I want your ideas. Obviously.